Welcome to Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck. Join host Hugh Duffy as he takes you behind the scenes with successful accountants, CPAs, and industry elites in conversations about growing a more profitable business. This podcast has been to prove that accountant marketing truly does not suck and, in fact, can provide you with new skills to improve your effectiveness so you can learn how to develop a business that you want to run, not a business that's running you. Hello, and welcome to the Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast. I'm your host, Hugh Duffy, and on today's show, we'll be talking to Kevin Mikeworth with Beer CPA. Kevin and Laura Mikeworth operate Beer CPA, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services to craft breweries. Before introducing Kevin, I'd like to share some of the insights on why our listeners would like to hear about Kevin's interesting niche and his background. Kevin graduated from Millican University and holds a BS degree in marketing. Kevin's background includes sales, managerial roles, as well as ownership positions in the food service industry. Laura Mikeworth, Kevin's wife, has over 30 years of CPA, accounting, and tax experience. So as a team, the two of them together operate this business, Beer CPA. Beer CPA has been servicing the craft brewing industry since 1996. On the advisory side of their business, they have a variety of coaching programs and educational programs for new craft brews. With that introduction, let me introduce to you Kevin Mikeworth. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, welcome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. This will be fun, and I'm, I'm very interested to learn more about your story. Um, let's, let's start there. In your words, can you paint a picture for our listeners about Beer CPA and your story? Well, it's kind of funny. Um, I've been brewing beer for since the early 90s, and uh, about almost five years ago, I stopped at a little brewery right near our, our building, our office building, and um, sitting there chatting with the guys. They wanted to know who owned the little yellow building up along the highway. They wanted to put a sign out there, and their brewery was going to be a bigger brewery behind our building, and they wanted to know if I knew who it was, and I said, yeah, that would be me. <laughs> and uh, they said, oh, man, we want to put a sign. I said, that would be great. No problem. But there's there's no strings attached. There's ropes attached. That rope is, we will be your CPA firm. <laughs> and, uh, we sat down together, and we learned the business together. They were in a little garage. They were home brewers like me. And today, I think they're in nine states. So, And they're right uh, one block behind our building. Wow. That's how we got started. That's cool. That's really neat. And uh, what's the, can you mention the name of that client that's in the yeah, United States? This District 9 Brewing Company. They're known for their sours. They have a very strong sour beer program um, throughout the, uh, I guess it would be the Mid-Atlantic area in mm-hmm. the South. Okay. So. so, you know, going back to the early 80s, I mean, I remember personally, North Carolina was not really known for their beer. And in fact, they had just two breweries at the time and the world's changed immensely since then. In fact, I remember back in those days, it was actually a 3-2 beer state and that there were many funky beer laws stemming back from the prohibition days. Today, North Carolina has over 260, 260 craft breweries and brew pubs more than the state of Florida, more than the state of Texas, even though the population in North Carolina is not as large as Florida or Texas. And as I understand it, Asheville was a spark that created the beer explosion in North Carolina and is considered to be the beer capital of the East. What took off, what happened in Asheville, and why did this evolve and and, and just blow up within the state? Well, Asheville's kind of an interesting little community. Um, very similar to the San Francisco crowd, so to speak. And, um, but they're right in the mountains and they've got great water. And I really think it was, uh, the people and the waters what made the difference. And I mean, that's why Sierra Nevada moved to put their brewery in, Oscar Blues put their brewery in there, as well as New Belgium. And, uh, they're all pulling water right out of the natural uh, rivers coming through the mountains. Mm, it's a beautiful area as well. Today, there are many great beers in North Carolina that are nationally recognized. Some brands that some of our listeners may not be familiar with, they're called Brown Truck, Heist Brewery, Highland Brewery, 
Burial, Burial Beer, Wicked Weed, Green Man Brewery. Obviously, you know, Kevin just talked about some of the national brands that have moved in or large regional brands that moved into Western North Carolina. How is the craft brew industry continuing to evolve within the state of North Carolina? Well, one of the things that they did back several years ago was uh, pass the law that let us do self-distribution. And that's really where a lot of the birth of all these breweries are coming from. Um, if you look at some of the other states that are around us, they have to go through a distributor. Um, so if I have a brewery and across the street is a bar, I have to go to a distributor, sell it to him, and he has to deliver to that bar. I cannot walk it across the street. So in North Carolina, they let us go up to 25,000 barrel ceiling. Anything up to that ceiling, I can put it in the back of my car um, as a licensed brewery and deliver it um, anywhere I want in the state of North Carolina. So it's opened the door for a small guy to not have to do the competition for a distributor. That, and most of the distributors were the Miller Coors, AV InBev, which is, you know, uh, Anheuser-Busch. Um, they control the distributors. So if you're a little guy just getting started and you want to go out and sell beer in the street, um, you've got this 8,000-pound gorilla at the back of the truck and you're in the front corner. And uh, it made it tough uh, to get out and get the beer started, you know, the brewery started. And that's what you're seeing around a lot of states around the South is they're stuck, you know, they've got that law that won't let them go out and do self-distribution. So a garage brewer like me, I, I'm, a, I'm a whole brewer, um, I wanted to open a brewery. I could go through the jumping jacks, get all my licenses and so forth, and I could go out and start selling my own beer. Mm. So it's given a lot of guys an opportunity for the micro breweries um, to get started. And that's why you're seeing such a good growth in North Carolina. It gives them a great distribution advantage, or at least levels the playing field, let's put it that way, which is fantastic to hear. Are there many states like that that have this self-distribution type law enabling the you know, small startups to be able to get into business and at least compete? There's quite a few states. Um, I mean, you can go on the Brewers Association site and they've got a, a map in there to show you who's got what for distribution. Um, but I mean, if you take a look at where, uh, you know, Michigan, um, Wisconsin, um, then you go out and get all of your California, California, Oregon, Colorado, a lot of these states where there's lots of growth, that's where the growth comes from. Um, it starts at the grassroots okay. and works the so let's transition and talk about, uh, you know, we could talk all day about the category, uh, which I love as well. Uh, let's transition and talk a little bit about your firm services. What's your sweet spot for a prospect? Well, we really have two sweet spots. Um, when we started with our first brewery, we joined the North Carolina Craft Brewers Guild. And uh, we're their accounting firm. And we're in their uh, conference. They have an annual conference to invite all the breweries in the state. And we, I've been teaching classes for the last four years on how to open a brewery. So mm -hmm. our, our sweet spot was we, we've got a three-map program. We call it our roadmap. One is for brewers and planning. You know, the, it takes a good three to five years sometimes to get a brewery up and running. Then there's a brewery in construction. We have that program, and then we have our uh, open the door, full back of the house, where we're doing their uh, all their excise taxes, their their bookkeeping, their payroll, their some consulting, uh, as well as the tax returns at the end of the year. So we, what, our whole philosophy is to give them a little bit of peace of mind of having good numbers, but secondly, is to go out and make beer and sell beer. Let us handle the stuff they don't like. Uh, there's a lot of taxation in breweries, and uh, it's pretty complicated roadmap. It's alcohol. It's a sin tax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it county by county as well, or even town by town? Uh, it, 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 and it varies, yes. Um, 
this, I'm in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and uh, Mecklenburg County has its own ABC. Uh, we have to get an ABC license here and their own, uh, I call it the ABC police force, but they, that they have a food and beverage tax that they charge. And of course, then there's a sales tax and uh, several other taxes that are required, uh, both federal and state. And why does, it take, why does it take three to five years to get up and running as a, a new craft brew? That sounds like a long lead time to me. Well, if you stop and think about it, you got a couple of guys brewing beer in their garage, and I want to open a brewery. And uh, location's probably the biggest challenge they've got once they've made the decision to do it. The second biggest decision is how are they going to fund it? And funding is, is tough. Um, you know, a, a, an average 15-barrel brewery, you know, just is a million five or more to get open. And so are you going to borrow it all? Um, do you have any money? Are you going to, you know, you're going to go to SBA? Are you going to go to family? Are you going to go out and find investors? That's a pretty strong road that you've got to go out to get your financing together to get that thing open the doors. So it should take a while to get all of that together and then to go do the build out. Once you find your location, um, most folks are looking for an older warehouse, you know, a lower price point per square foot. But when you get into there, you got to tear all the floors out. You got to put your drains in. Um, I mean, if you look at a brewery, it's a manufacturing facility. So he, he has all kinds of uh, obstacles or I guess I call them obstacles to get this thing open by meet, meeting all the safety standards and all the codes and so forth um, on the manufacturing side. Then you've got their retailing side, which is their tap room. Again, you know, they're two separate businesses in one. Um, Taxation's different between the two. And then of course, then they get into going out and doing distribution. So then you've got your distribution on. So, it's like three businesses in one once you get up and running and uh, using your second year. So, uh, and the tap room is where the high margins are? Yeah, yeah, we generally say it's uh, about four times. You make about four times the profit through the tap room versus going out and going through distribution outside of the brewery. So you're better off to build your community uh, first and get that up and running and then look at the uh, distribution down the road, um, you know, as uh, extra business. That's how I look at it. Sure, sure. No, understood. And, and what motivated you to start this niche? What, Where was the, sp the spark? Where was the interest, the passion, um, besides, you know, doing a little bit of brewing yourself? Um, it's a niche. And um, I, I kind of got the brewer bug. So I went out and I've learned, I read, I think if you look at our little library that we've got here for our brewers, I think I've got just about every brewery book you can dream of uh, sitting out here on our shelves. And um, and the, the best thing is too, is my partner got into it as much as I did. Hmm. So when the two of you that are running the company, oh, she doesn't like beer, okay? No, sours aren't beer to her. She can have sours, they're great. Um, but no, she doesn't drink beer, she drinks mine. I got gotcha. you. Um, and let's, why don't you paint a picture for our listeners, since they may or may not know who the typical person is that opens a craft brew. Why don't you describe who that is and what, what their particular needs are? Where we see a majority of the um, prospective brewers come out of the IT field. And and you're like, huh? That doesn't make sense. Well, think about it. They're very um, meticulous. They're very numbers oriented. They they take a recipe, follow it to the T, keep great records, and the, also they can do IT work at the same time that they've opened the brewery. So most of them are are working in the brewery, doing their IT job as well as um, growing their business in their brewery. So I see most of those guys are IT guys. So 
they basically need to have funding to carry them at least three to five years. Uh, as they start to get up and running and it starts to catch on, how does their particular needs evolve and change? Well, there's always new, shiny new stuff to make their beer better. And they're constantly buying new equipment. And generally they've got what they call the brew house, which is the manufacturing side. Um, they'll reach capacity about two or three years, and then they've got to make a decision. Am I going to move my brewery? Am I, if I do that, do I get a bigger one? And if I do that, I need to get a bigger brew house. So I may go from a 10 barrel up to a 30 barrel, and I've got to change all my fermenters. So it, it, we look at it as like three phases. First phase, get it open. Second phase, add more tags. Third phase is going out, making a decision. Uh, do we stay with what we got, or do we want to go up and get um, a new brew house and, then, and a new brewery? Um, we're also seeing the atmosphere change from just having a tap room to having um, two or three tap rooms. We can have in North Carolina, you can have uh, three outside tap rooms other than your own tap room. So it might make sense instead of going out and doing distribution to set up other retail facilities that are yours coming in with your own beer um, and not going out and doing the grocery store wars. And when you paint a picture for how some of your clients uh, who have been doing it longer have taken off, paint us a picture for that and how it's gone. I mean, you mentioned one that's it's operating in seven states, so that on the surface sounds to me like a, a major success story, but share with our listeners a little bit about the insights and what you've seen in, as they've grown up. We want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, BizPayo, which is short for Business Payments Online. Maybe you've seen some of their advertising elsewhere or the feature article in Accounting Today. Here's why accountants across the country are big fans of BizPayo. BizPayo is an online system for sending out engagement proposals and then getting paid on autopilot. If you hate chasing existing clients for payment, then BizPayo is a tool you need to have in your arsenal. Here are some of the amazing reasons why BizPayo is so popular. BizPayo's engagement tool enables you to send out proposals and client agreements. Once approved by your prospective client, it enables you to get paid electronically going forward with less effort so you don't need to chase clients for payment. BizPayo accepts recurring and one-shot payments online, both e-check, credit card, and debit card payments with less hassle. BizPayo enables you to get paid by credit card and debit card payments at $0 net cost. This is very different than PayPal, Intuit Merchant Services, and other payment systems that take a fee in excess of 3% of each payment to you. BizPayo enables you to recover those fees so you get paid for plastic charge card payments at $0 net cost. BizPayo also syncs with QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop, so all your payments are posted seamlessly. With BizPayo, there's no nickel and dime charges either. There's no equipment costs, no processing minimums, no PCI charges, and so on. So go to bizpayo.com, that's B-I-Z-P-A-Y-O.com, and get paid in full like you deserve. Well, they generally have one or two beers that just take off, okay? It could be a, an IPA, it could be um, a sour beer. Sour beers in the South it, it is extremely popular. So, but it's a hard beer to make consistently because it's you're using a lot of uh, uh, wild yeast, and wild uh, ingredients in there. And um, they can get away from you. You're not on top of it. But um, you've got to find one or two niches to make it run. Um, just having the same old seven beers, um, there's such a variety out there with the number of breweries around, you constantly need to be bringing in or manufacturing something um, a little different. I mean, because most folks come in, they'll get a flight and say, I want to taste four or five of your beers. Um, and then that's the one that I want to drink. So you could get stale rather quickly in this business especially when you do have all the choices out there today. 
Hmm. That makes sense? It, it does. It does. So let's transition and talk a little bit about the marketing that you've done for Beer CPA. Um, paint us a picture there in terms of what you've done to be successful, how you've gotten to where you are, and, and, and what you're going to change going forward. Well, what we're doing um, that's worked for us, um, believe it or not, was teaching a class on how to open a brewery. I'm getting phone calls from people that four years ago that were in my class, and they're like, hey, I'm ready now. I was in your class. Um, we also published a book, and uh, the book has kind of been uh, kind of our business card. It mm -hmm. gives us a little bit of credibility. Um, and uh, so that was one of the marketing tools that we used. But right now, it's referrals that, that teach in that class. Um, and uh, I work with uh, brewery attorneys, and I work with uh, a lot of uh, brewery uh, shirts companies. Those are the guys that, that, that refer a tremendous amount of business to us. What was the last one? Insurance. Oh, okay. Huge amounts of liability in that manufacturing facility. What do you mean by that? You're dealing with scalding hot water. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with ice cold um, glycol systems. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with CO2 that have CO2 poisoning. Um, you're doing canning and bottling lines. Um, I mean, it's a factory. Okay. So, so let's go back to your book publishing. Self-published. Tell us about yeah. the that process, the whole nine yards. I don't know if you can see it. I can. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's the 10, 10 most, most expensive tax mistakes. Yeah, the cost brewery owners thousands. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty general accounting book for running for small businesses. And, uh, and the brewery owners have, uh, what's funny is, have them coming up and asking us for our silly autograph. That just cracks us up. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. But anyway, it, and I, I mean, I don't even put a UPC on it to sell it. This is a brochure. This is my business card. I just stick a business card in it, and wherever we go, we'll hand a book out. That's great. Now, tell us about some of the shows that you do to hand that out, to get in front of people, to meet people that are prospects. Well, we do trade shows with the Brewers, Associ Brewers Association. We're getting ready to do one in Colorado here in April. Um, that one's heavily attended for the whole country. And then we're also doing uh, trade shows for uh, different Brewers Associations. Like in North Carolina, we do an annual, and then they have something called Brew Smart, which are like little three little mini training shows that they have in different areas of North Carolina. Um, more progressive, they got a very progressive uh, brewer skilled in North Carolina compared to some other states. Um, but then we're all excited. My uh, son just came in with us. He's a scientist, he's a, a geneticist and running labs for different colleges, and he ended up in Milwaukee. Mm. So he said, hey, we're com I'm coming in with you guys, because he's been brewing beer with me for a long time. So we opened our office in Milwaukee, and uh, we're we're 100% in the cloud. So it doesn't matter where we are or where he is. Uh, we've got breweries that we've never physically shaken hands with. We've done meetings like this many, many times and talked to them on a weekly basis. Um, but there's no need to have to be physically standing there in their brewery or in their office. I totally understand. Couldn't agree with you more. And, and Milwaukee has a lot of history with making beer. I mean, absolutely. It goes way back. Not not like, you know, it's new to North Carolina, but it's not new to Milwaukee whatsoever. They got 30 craft breweries just in Milwaukee. Mm. That's the little guys. Yeah. No, it's, it's in their blood. That I know. Uh, what forms of marketing have been most effective for you? Word of mouth and teaching the class, being involved in conferences. Okay. 
So is the class that you teach uh, a loss leader? Or do you recover your costs on it? Tell us about that. Well, the big thing is there is no um, what I call roadmap. There, how to open a brewery. There's lots of brewery books out there that said, this is what I did. But no, what I came out with is step one, step two, step three, step four. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get these guys that are getting ready to shell out, you know, many, many, many thousands of dollars. They want to get as much knowledge as they can. So when you've got as many breweries as we have, that's probably our most valuable um, tool is our knowledge. Mm -hmm. We always laugh and we say, yeah, we know where we're crossing that river. We know where all the rocks are so we can walk across and not step in that hole. Sure. So, but especially at, at the front end. And then once they open, they've been working with us for a while. Um, but we're also flat feet, which kind of blows people away. And we, uh, it, it, it works real well. We get a, our weekly fee, a little draft, and eat swallowable bites, and um, we just move forward. So you're doing it by ACH processing once a week? Yes. That's great. That's perfect. To, don't even have to invoice it. Once we have an agreement on what the fee is, that's one less thing they got to deal with, one less thing that we have to deal with. Yeah, the way you approach it is exactly how we've been teaching for years. So let's transition and talk a little bit about craft distillers. Have you gotten into that side of the equation? Because I know that that's taken off as well in certain regions of the country. Well, most of them are real small. Okay. Um, it, it's pretty tough in, in, in this part of the country where we are um, because we have state stores. So they can't go out and do any kind of distribution. I know they just passed a law here through the last couple of years that they can actually sell a couple of bottles now out of their distillery. Um, most of the guys that we looked at, and we've talked to several, um, they've got a different set of rules and different things. Our niche is the breweries. We know it. We know it. And we, we know it all the way through the different stages. So we've elected not to, to deal with the distillers, um, and we elected not to deal with the cideries and the wineries. Um, first off, we don't want to do the accounting work for farmers, okay? That's not our niche. Yep. Um, and when you start looking at cideries, cideries are classified as wine, and it's a whole different set. So we just decided to stay where we are you know, we're only just doing a fraction of the breweries that are out there. We have a lot of low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we've got more than we can handle. I mean, not more than we can handle, but we've got a lot of opportunity out there. We just got to go out and get it and let them just tell our story. And, and Kevin, if you had an opportunity to go backwards, go back 10 years, what would you have done differently? Uh, in developing this niche that you've done with beer CPA? Well, 10 years ago, the laws were really stinky. <laughs> Probably run, not run away from it for a while. I mean, we need, it's really the last five or six years where the laws have started to change and where the growth factors start coming in. Um, you know, you had a few pioneers out here that, uh, you know, they've been around for 10, 15 years. And by that time, they've survived um, through some ups and downs in the brewing industry that there were just a handful of them left, in my opinion, That and they all had in-house accounts. And we, we like the smaller guys that don't have, where we could really, they don't have enough money to go out and have an in-house account working full time, okay? But we're able to give them this very similar services and help them through um, and help them grow their business. Uh, I don't think we've, we've only had one brewery that went out of business, but it was because the two partners went their separate ways. So all of our other breweries that we've ever opened, um, 
they're still open and running. So they got off on the right foot. And that's that to me makes me my heart look better pattern. No, yeah, it should. It should. You should be very proud because it shocks me the success rate that you just mentioned. Um, tell me tell me a little bit about this group that you have of folks that refer to each other because you know who's good and who's not. You know, you had mentioned, you know, the, the guild, you had mentioned the insurance companies, you had talked about the beer uh, attorneys. Tell me about this group that you have and how you help each other to work collaboratively to help the industry um, as well as basically to help each other. Well, one of the things I teach in my class is you need to go out and set up your team of professionals. Okay. In my book, I, I you know, I did leave out the uh, the bankers. I should have had the bankers in there too. Okay. Uh, but you, you need to have a good banker, a good insurance company. You need to have a good attorney. You need to have a good accountant and you need to have a good um, architect. And my whole feeling is they need to be done at least three, if not four breweries. Anybody can stumble through one or two, but if you've done four, um, chances of success are pretty good. We had a brewery that um, opened uh, on the coast and he went into a strip center and uh, the guy that owned the strip center said, well, we want you to use our architect. And they asked that architect, have you ever done a brewery before? He says, oh yeah, I've worked with a brewery. Well, when they turned their plans in, this guy put the hot water heater in their taproom cooler, okay? That's where the hot, and they turned the plans in, the planning committee looked at them, rejected it, and kind of branded them as idiots, so to speak. So it took them an extra six months to get open. And then when they get questioned in this guy, this guy says, well, I just put an awning on a bird. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And the funny thing is, um, when I, you know, two or three different years, the gentleman that owned that brewery was helping me teach, and he told the story on himself, okay, mm -hmm. that you know, he lost thousands of dollars because he trusted a professional for what a professional said. So if you can find a professional, well, no matter, you know, what industry that you're in, but you need to find a professional out there that has uh, experience in the business that you're in that you want to go and uh, start up and to get running. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's really what we do. We, we all meet up at the different conferences and we talk and we laugh and carry on, but we're also very serious about passing the business back. And, and at it, what point does a client become too large for your firm in terms of accounting and tax needs? Well, what happens is when they start getting real large, they then bring an in-house accountant in, mm -hmm. or an outside accountant in the in-house. And then, then it's beyond us. We've got, there's a, a brewery in Charlotte that was a sizable brewery. He wasn't our brewery, but um, once he got to a certain level, he brought in a CPA that had a little bit of brewery experience and as a full-time person. Okay. So that's really the wall that we hit, and that's okay. You know, that's not our sweet spot when they're they're getting into those bigger levels. I totally agree. No, I and, and I get it, and that's why I asked the question. You can't be all things to all people. You don't want to be. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, in some of these other states, do they have a guild like this to help people, you know, start up as, as a business or not? Or is this unique to well, North Carolina? No, it's not unique, but it's, it's, I mean, every state has a guild. It's just, you know, how, how's the, how, um, how is the industry in that state and how, how much support do they have? How much money do they have in order to grow? Um, North Carolina, once, once we, we got, you know, we had a huge handful of breweries and then we got three big gorillas that came in and then it really put some power behind uh, the guild to go out and, and really the guild's out looking after the breweries, they, you know, they go to the legislature, they're trying to get the rules changed, um, you know, and, and they're also here to help. 
you know, I can tell you that, you know, Virginia's got a strong bill. They, they, you know, that's, a, that's a big market for a lot of breweries in Virginia. South Carolina is just now changing their laws. They're starting to grow. Um, Georgia's really had their handcuffs on. Used to be in Georgia, if you wanted to go to a brewery, to a tap room, you had to buy a tour. And then they would give you tickets for a sampling for the tour. Okay. So you just couldn't, they didn't have tap rooms. You couldn't walk in and sit there and order the beer. Um, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, a lot of those other states. I mean, these guys are all, a lot of the Bible Belt states are starting to, to look at the, how North Carolina is doing, how we're growing, how the revenue is coming in to the state. And they're all taking uh, second looks to think about lightening up the laws. So um, it, it's interesting to see that, but, the strong guilds, you know, Michigan strong. You you go looking at the markets where most of the breweries are. Mm -hmm. They usually have a pretty good sized guild and a strong guild. Well, I, I think what you're doing is fabulous, both for the community, for your passion. I, I personally believe if you can marry up your passion with what you do professionally, it just it's a great combination. It makes life so much what so much more interesting and enables you to do what you do best. And I know your background is marketing. Your wife's is accounting and sales as a CPA. And uh, I think it's fabulous what the two of you are doing. Uh, Kevin, I'd like to thank you for openly sharing your story. Uh, I think it's been fabulous. I've enjoyed learning from you. For those interested in learning more, uh, I would encourage you to visit his website, which is www.beercpa.com. Not too hard to spell. Nothing funny there. <laughs> B-E-E-R-C-P-A.com. I think it's fabulous what you're doing. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you.